Welcome to the City Current Show. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. We're always honored to bring you inspiring stories of individuals and organizations making a difference, empowering the good, and we love filling you with inspiration. We're honored to have with us Ken Rideout. He is the co-host of the popular podcast, The Fight with Teddy Atlas, who's the legendary boxing trainer. Ken is one of the world's top master athletes. He's one of the top over 50 marathoners in the world. We have so much to talk about, but let's start out, Ken. How are you doing? Good, man. How are you? Doing good. Let's dive in because you do have a powerful story of overcoming addiction to recovery. When you look at boxing and marathons and how all that plays in, give us a little bit of just your childhood. Let's start there. Yeah, I grew up in the inner city of uh, Boston and um, it was, uh, you know, very kind of lower middle class, I guess. Blue collar neighborhood. Um, for context, when I graduated from high school, I put myself through college working as a guard in a maximum security prison. And uh, my brother and stepfather were both inmates in that prison, which maybe provides a little bit more context as to that kind of environment I grew up in. Um, and yeah, working my way through college, uh, working as a guard at the prison. I played football and hockey and NCAA sports in um, college. And then, uh, and then uh, upon graduation, moved to New York, started working in finance and lived in London, New York, Hong Kong, and LA. And now I live in Nashville. And so when you look at making the transition to Wall Street, you know, so much of that, that competitive nature plays a role. So talk about that and how all of a sudden, you know, the Wall Street didn't necessarily fulfill you. And so all of a sudden addiction and some of that comes into the, the play as well. Yeah, good question. So when I moved to New York, I like you said, I started working in finance. I moved to New York. I had a sociology degree. I was working at a pharmaceutical company in a sales role. And I was going to the gym and playing uh, in a hockey league and an ice hockey league. And I saw all these young kids working in finance, young guys my age. And I thought, man, these guys are all making money, but there's nothing, doesn't seem to be anything special about them. But of course, at the time, if you had told me growing up or even in college that I should move to New York and work in finance, I would have thought, well, why not just be an astronaut? It was as foreign to me as that, you know, and, and, but once I saw the caliber of guys that were doing it, I realized, Hey, this, I, I'm just going to get, I'm just going to out hustle these guys. And eventually I was given an opportunity in a low ranking position and just very quickly climbed the ladder within a year or two of working in finance. I moved to London and was running um, European and Asian commodity sales and trading um, and just quickly moved through the ranks in finance. And um, along the way, like you mentioned, the uh, addiction became an issue. I was suffering massively from a fraud complex or imposter syndrome as I, you know, felt, um, very insecure about my academic and professional pedigree relative to my peers. And um, I was introduced to uh, Percocet after a, a surgery on my ankle. I was always very active. And once I found those, uh, once I found opioids, I thought they were the answer to my insecurity prayers. And um, unfortunately, thus began a um, probably a 10 year odyssey of on and off drugs of being a functioning full time addict. And it was a uh, it was a nightmare and um, one that I am happy to say is in the rearview mirror now. It's you never kind of once you're an addict, I, I, I genuinely believe you're always an addict. There's always that kind of um, feeling in the back of your mind, like if if you show any weaknesses, you could fall right back into that cycle. So that's a constant struggle. And like you mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm a competitive marathon runner and that's kind of become my antidepressant slash, um, uh, kind of way of governing myself. And by, but, but it's, I always tell people it's very hard to be a, a competitive athlete and a junkie at the same time. So, um, I prefer the accolades of being a competitive athlete over feeling like, a, um, a loser. I know that marathons weren't originally in your, you know, in the picture of where you wanted to go with this. So talk about how you got into running marathons. Yeah. So when I moved to New York, I was uh, boxing for the New York Athletic Club, uh, you know, competitive amateur boxing. And um, 
as a way of dealing with the addiction, I started running just, I, I just started running a little bit every day. I, I, I initially got into Ironman triathlon, just long distance triathlon, because the longer I could exercise, it was the longer I could sit with myself and my thoughts of being, of using drugs. And um, I competed at the Ironman World Championships in Hawaii three times. And, and my wife and I started a, started a family. We adopted a daughter from Ethiopia, and then we had three biological children. And once I had, you know, my first child, and actually after I had the fourth one, the 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 Ironman triathlon just took so much time that I started to focus exclusively on running and didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't have a coach. My goal was just to run 10 miles a day. When I would get 10 weeks out from a race, I'd start to incorporate one 20 mile run per week. And by doing that, I got myself from a 320 marathon down to a 233 uh, in the marathon. And then once I got to 233, I hired a running coach called Mario Freoli. He hosts a podcast called The Morning Shakeout. And um, from there, I got down to 228. And um, the day before I turned 50, I won the Myrtle Beach Marathon. And I've won a bunch of uh, half marathons and other races along the way. But yeah, when I think about it, in hindsight, it doesn't even seem believable to me because I don't think of myself as a good athlete and certainly not a runner. But I guess to runners, uh, you know, I, I compare myself to the pros and to the best runners. So when I look at the Kenyans and Ethiopians running like two hours and five minutes to two hours flat, I think, oh, my God, I'm a world away. But I guess compared to the average, you know, weekend warrior, I'm like, I'm the king of the weekend warriors. But so much of it, too, like you've been talking about, it's the competitive nature it's the, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to train harder than anybody else. I'm going to go, you know, 10 miles or more a day. I'm going to do whatever it takes to reach that next level. So talk about kind of that mental side that's made you successful to pour in and continue pushing through when others might stop. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, that's, a, that's a very good point. And that is one thing I suffer from a lot of insecurities. Like I said, that imposter syndrome or frog complex is a very real phenomenon, at least for me. But um, the one thing that I do have supreme confidence in is my the strength of my mindset and my ability to suffer. And when I look at running, it's a very uh, simple formula. The person who trains the hardest and trains the most wins. And like today, for instance, it's we have tornado warnings. It's torrential downpours. I ran, it, it started dumping rain halfway through my run, but I finished it. And the whole time, the, I just kept reminding myself, like, no one else is doing this. These are the little things that make the big difference on race day. Races are won on days like today or days like the day after Christmas when it's, you know, five degrees, not many people are going to be out there suffering. And when you add in all those, uh, all those days on the margins where someone else might take those days off to me, that's where the magic happens. And then race day is that's the easy part. That's like the beauty contest. Like everything you've done to get fit has been done race day. You just show up and get to show everyone what you've been doing. So much of it with professional athletes, they talk about the process. You have to love and enjoy the process. And just like you say, the competition, the game, like that's the icing on the cake. But if you don't love the process of going in there and putting in the time and effort to sweat, you're not going to get the results. And so I, I love just that aspect of, hey, you've got to love the process of doing it, whether it's rain, sleet, snow, ice, whatever it takes to be able to then do well in the competition. You might not think you're enjoying it at the time, but you callous your mind to the idea of taking that day off. It, it's not an option for me unless there's like real physical danger, which is very rare. You've just got to do it. And I equate it to like climbing a mountain, like a big mountain. Anyone that has is audacious enough to climb this big mountain thinking that they're going to get to the top and just enjoy the view. And that's going to be the ultimate reward. What they realize typically is that when you get to the top, there's a higher mountain mountain in the distance. And, and if you talk to a lot of endurance athletes and competitive marathon runners, et cetera, there's a huge letdown typically after an event, even when you win, because what you realize is that that suffering, the process, being in the training mode is where you're at your best. When I have structure and uh, and and a strictly defined day, I'm going to wake up at this time, I'm going to do this, then I'm going to work from these hours, then I've got the kids, I'm going to take them to jujitsu, then I'm going to take them here. It sounds crazy, but 
that's where the magic happens. That's where I'm at my best. That's where I'm like finding flow state. Yeah, it's nice to have a couple of days off after a race, sure. But there is kind of this emotional letdown of like, mm, now I got to think about what's next because without anything for me, and I think for people like me that that are competitive, it's like without a goal in the future, it's kind of like if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. And life is, the, the clock's ticking on all of us. So it's like, what are you going to accomplish while you're here? I don't want to spend weekends binge watching Netflix when I could have been, you know, doing some life changing event or, or participating in something other than observation. Right. I, do, I don't want to participate. I want to compete. I want to like enjoy everything. If it was an amusement park, you know, some people prefer to like, oh, let me find one ride. I'm just going to stay here. Whereas I want to see every single ride multiple times so I can decide where I want to hang out for the majority of my time in this place. Anyway, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. And you're taking all of this and you're paying it forward and, and really using this as inspiration to help others. And so talk about rideoutstrong.com. Yeah, so at rideoutstrong.com, we're helping people um, become better marathon runners, runners in general, but ultimately marathon runners. We've brought together some of the best coaches in the world. We've got running coaches, human performance, strength and conditioning, and it's an all-encompassing program. We've got incredible corporate sponsors and partners that have provided beautiful merchandise with our logo and name brand on there. Um, so yeah, we're helping people achieve their goals. And I think the marathon is a great metaphor for life because it's something that everyone, for the most part, can, can accomplish. And especially for people who've never done it before, I think when they look at a marathon, it can be a daunting task. But once they realize that, you know, if you take it one day at a time, one step at a time, it's very manageable. And we're helping people um, kind of see the experience that... Um, that kind of victory of, of of accomplishing some physical goals. And I think it carries through in, in all areas of your life. I mentioned at the onset, the podcast, the fight with Teddy Atlas, your co-host of that podcast. Give us a little bit of a teaser on the podcast. Yeah, we cover, we cover um, boxing on a weekly basis, sorry, boxing and MMA. So we'll cover UFC, the bigger boxing events. We've interviewed most of the champions in the UFC, um, Dana White, Jake Paul, uh, most of the world champions from boxing, uh, guys like Regis Pro Gray, uh, even we've had Evander Holyfield on, like tons of um, former greats. Um, Teddy Atlas was uh, one of Mike Tyson's very first trainers. Teddy trained 18 world champions, so he's got a wealth of knowledge. So we'll break down the fight action from every weekend on um, days like yesterday where there's a quiet week in the sport. We might go back and revisit some classic fights and break it down round by round. Uh, yesterday, we recorded a um, end of year, best of two 2022, fight of the year, knockout of the year. And then we covered some of what we're looking forward to in 2023. So it's a comprehensive breakdown of all the combat sports and all the action going on around the world. How has being co-host of that podcast recalibrated or, or changed the way you look at marathon running and training? So how has that how has that helped you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, to, one of the things that we describe on the podcast that, uh, as the motivation for the podcast was basically connecting the dots of life through fighting and using fighting as a metaphor for life because we're all in a fight, right? You've got to get up, you've got to record your interviews, you've got to prepare for them, someone has to edit them. This is all part of the process. And and all, just like with fighting in every aspect of life, there is a, there's a, a fair component, preparation, training and in particular fear fear doesn't have to be fear of being punched in the face it could be fear of having a guest on that you feels like you're pulling teeth when you're doing an interview it could be um intimidation of interviewing a big name guest that is like you, you want to make sure you bring your a game right so how do we deal with that fear and it's what i tell my children all the time it's like everyone feels the same emotions fear dread sorrow the only difference is how we cope with those emotions. And as a fighter, you know, you, you, the one of the worst parts or one of the hardest parts of a fight is that period right before the fight when you're in the locker room getting ready to make that walk to the ring. And these are things that Teddy Atlas talks about on the show, but you can apply those to all areas of life. Right before you're about to record an episode, I'm sure there are guests that you're feeling like, ooh, I get a little bit nervous. And if you don't, you start to feel like you miss that feeling because I do it myself when we record our podcast. I'm not nearly as nervous as I used to be, 
But when I'm not, I'm like, oh, let me get, get back in touch with what's going on here. Like that fear brings out the best in you, lets you know that you're ready and it's time to like perform. So yeah, the, the podcast has helped um, kind of put into terms some of the feelings that I've always experienced and certainly helped me get better as a runner. Certainly having a guy like Teddy Alice in my corner and being able to talk to him about um, big races. He'll call me the day before a race, talk about what's going on and just being able to talk about, you know, the emotions that I'm feeling is is massively helpful. What are some of your goals? We're still early on in 2023. So what are your goals for this year? Yeah, thank you for asking. I'm going to um, Tokyo in nine weeks for the Tokyo Marathon. That's the final uh, world marathon major that I haven't run. There's six world marathon majors, uh, London, Berlin, Tokyo, New York, Chicago, Boston. I finished first or second in all of them. And Tokyo is the last of the six. There's only a handful of people in the world that have run all six of them. I happen to have done it in under two years, which is very rare. Um, and then in October, I'll run the Chicago Marathon, which is happens to be the age group world championship race for this coming year. So I finished second the first time I did that race in London by less than a minute. And um, I'll look to try to be the world champion this time around in Chicago. Very exciting and uh, definitely best of luck for that ahead. Talk about website. We mentioned one, but mention website, social media. Where can we go to follow your efforts? Yeah, thank you for asking. Rideoutstrong.com. You can find information on the Marathon Training Program. And I like to stay fairly active on Instagram at Ken Rideout. Um, and I post periodic updates about my training. I try to keep it motivational. I think some people find it inspiring. And uh, yeah, it's been a great experience. I think social media gets a bad rap, but I've had a very good experience with social media. Um, you know, for me personally, my children aren't allowed on social media, but I've, I've enjoyed sharing my journey with uh, people that are interested uh, via, via Instagram. Well, Ken, you are a change maker indeed. So thank you for all you do. Thank you for coming on the show. Appreciate you, Jeremy. Thanks for having me.